this lecture, we'll be looking at the death of Caesar and the aftermath. We'll start by looking at Caesar's dictatorships and then the response of Cassius Brutus and some of the other senators to Caesar declaring himself dictator for life. And finally, we'll look at the situation in Rome after Caesar's death and the arrival of Octavian. So Caesar used the office of dictator a number of times from the moment that he crossed the Rubicon in 49 and made his way into Rome until his death in 44. In 49, he declared himself dictator for just a few days in order to preside over elections. So once he made his way into Rome, he declared himself dictator and appointed himself consul. So this was done for a very limited reason and he quickly renounced the office. In 48, he held the office of dictator for an entire year after the victory at Pharsalus. So at this moment, he resembled in some ways Sola, who also held the office of dictator for a year after his victory in the Civil War in order to settle matters at Rome. In 47, Caesar once again declared himself dictator in order to make sure that he was elected consul for the following year. So you can see that he is using this office of dictator partly to guarantee himself the consulship, which was a more recognizably legal form of power. In 46, we see that he's voted annual dictatorships by the Senate for 10 years. And this may have been part of the Senate's sort of secret plan to rouse um, anger against Caesar and to rouse concerns that Caesar was becoming a tyrant. So by voting him an annual dictatorship, in other words, basically a 10-year period as dictator, the Senate was making it clear that Caesar was holding all the power, um, that he was standing above everybody else in Rome, including duly elected consuls, as well as the rest of the Senate. And in 45, Caesar was made the sole consul. Um, so he, in essence, once again held dictatorship, but also occupied the consulship and did not have a colleague in the consulship to balance his authority in any way. Um, he did resign in the fall, and in 44 was once again made consul, but also in, 40, in February 44 declared himself dictator in perpetuum. So, um, in other words, dictator for life. And he does this in advance of a plan to, in fact, leave Rome for the East. He's planning to go fight a war against the Parthians. Um, and so in 44, in the early spring, late winter of 44, he's planning his departure. And here's a, another coin that's showing Caesar as dictators, again, once again, showing both the fact that he allows himself, although living, to be represented on coinage, but also the fact that he's not ashamed of his dictatorships. He celebrates them. He thinks that this is, in fact, a legitimate way to govern the Roman world. So in the, in the period leading up to Caesar's death, his hold on the dictatorship and his, his desire to be a single ruler, his unwillingness to recognize the value of rule even by two consuls and certainly by the Senate is a factor that leads to his eventual assassination. Uh, the, his relationship with the Senate has broken down to really being irreparable. Um, and this really goes back to his year as consul, um, when he fought with Bibulus and the Senate to try to get land legislation passed, and the Senate refused to compromise with him. And it was at that point that Caesar came to see that the Senate was not a body that he wished to work with. Um, he gave up hope of working with them and looked to control power and consolidate power on his own. But by 44, his relationship with the Senate has seriously degenerated. And the, the Senate recognizes it. this. It recognizes that its own authority as a body is in serious jeopardy, um, certainly by the spring of 44, as Caesar's getting ready to leave town and has declared himself dictator for life. It's also at this period that Cleopatra's in Rome. She had come to Rome in 45. Um, and set up house with Caesar. And there's a lot of talk that Caesar is thinking of making Cleopatra queen of Rome um, and himself king of Rome, and that Rome will become a kind of 
Egyptian colony, as it were, or a kind of province of Egypt. Caesar is open about his lack of respect for Republican institutions, not just the Senate, but for all things Republican, including just the very idea of the Republic. He thinks that it's seen its day, it's out of fashion, it's no longer an effective form of governance. Um, and he's very open about this. He mocks Sola for trying to reinstitute Repu a Republican form of government, says that Sola never should have laid down his dictatorship. Um, but it's really that decision to make himself dictator for life that leads the Senate to believe that they need to take action in the early spring of 44. So he is on the Ides of March, stabbed by a contingent of senators that is led by Brutus and Cassius. Um, and Brutus, you'll recognize the name, is a distant relative, um, a, a long um, sort of uh, separate descendant, um, long distant descendant of that original Brutus who is given credit for founding the Republic in 509 BC. Um, so there's a kind of echo here of the foundation of the Republic by the first Brutus and now Brutus the Assassin doing everything he can to try to keep the Republic alive. Caesar's assassination very much echoes some of the stories that we get, particularly in Livy, about Romulus's murder by the Senate. So eventually, so there's the story you remember that Romulus was taken up by a cloud um, in a kind of um, painless death, but there is also a version of Romulus's death in which he is killed by a mob of angry senators who feel like he's become a tyrant. And this is very much what has happened with Caesar, that when he becomes dictator for life, he's effectively declaring himself a king um, or a tyrant. Um, and this is what Romans had a, a strong aversion to. And when Caesar's assassinated, it's done on the argument that this is a defense of liberty. Um, and liberty forms a central um, part of the platform of the assassins. And it's also a defense of the Republic. It's an effort to save the institution of the Republic from some kind of transition into a monarchy, a some kind of one-man rule that Caesar seems to be envisioning. He hasn't quite worked out what it's going to look like, but by t making himself dictator for life, he is at least... Um, suggesting that in his own lifetime, the institutions of the Republic will be left behind. So here you have a visual representation of the events of the Ides of March, um, the, this image of the senators all crowding around with their daggers. Um, and this is not actually in the Senate House. Um, remember that the Senate House had burned down um, when Clodius was killed, um, there was a public riot and the Senate House burned down. And so the Senate is actually meeting in a room in the theater of Pompey. And so here you have um, a, a better view of um, the, the location. And in particular, note in the upper left-hand corner of the painting, this large statue of Pompey that's looming over everything. And there's a, a great irony here. Remember, it's Pompey that Caesar defeats at Pharsalus that, and allows him to even take control of Rome. And here he is being killed in the portico of Pompey's theater at the very feet of Pom this great statue of Pompey, this enormous statue of Pompey. So you kind of have Pompey um, overseeing everything here. So here are some review questions. I'll let you pause, go over these review questions at your own pace, and you can resume the lecture when you're ready. So in the aftermath of Caesar's assassination, initially there is great celebration. People running through the streets of Rome celebrating the Assassin's Act and celebrating liberty, the, the release of the Republic from the tyrant. Um, Caesar is cast in the role of a tyrant who is trying to overthrow the Republic. Pretty quickly, though, there's a realization that things are not going to just go back to normal. The Senate is not going to be restored 
to a position of authority. Um, that, in fact, what's happened with the assassination of Caesar is that a power vacuum has been created and that there are several people eager to feel that, fill that vacuum. One of the biggest names that is willing to fill that vacuum is Caesar's co-consul at the time, Mark Antony, um, and somebody that is interested in having power for himself, but also in protecting, in various ways, Caesar's legacy. Um, and Mark Antony was Caesar's loyal lieutenant during the Civil War. He was one. Of, he was responsible for bringing over from Italy reinforcements um, to Greece, to Western Greece, so that Caesar could successfully defeat Pompey um, at Pharsalus. And Antony had a lot of power in the aftermath of Caesar's assassination. Um, between him and Lepidus, who will come up in our story again, we have immediately uh, the, rec the recognition that the Senate is not going to, in fact, step in and be restored to its position of authority. So two days after Caesar's death, Caesar dies on the Ides of March, the 15th of March. And on the 17th of March, Antony summons the Senate, um, something that he's allowed to do as consul. He summons the Senate to meet, and a compromise is reached. So people, various senators, had, ver had differing views on the assassination of Caesar. Many of them supported it because they felt like it was the only way to regain their authority. But there were those that felt like they, the Senate had, in fact, overstepped its bounds. So they reach an agreement that there will be no action taken against the assassins. They won't be prosecuted for the murder of Caesar. But at the same time, all of Caesar's deeds, everything that Caesar did, will be ratified. And this, this second clause becomes a source of great contention, because part of what then happens is Antony and various other people claim to find writings of Caesar that contain Caesar's plans for the future, and that they argue then that those should also be ratified or put into action. And we start to get forgeries coming up, um, all sorts of people claiming they know what Caesar intended and that Caesar's intention should be also carried out with the, uh, with the stamp of approval of the Senate. So it's the second clause that actually comes to be a significant problem in the aftermath of the assassination. But certainly immediately afterwards, we see Antony brokering a deal um, in which essentially Caesar's assassins are given a free pass. In the days after the assassination, so about a week after Caesar's murder, a public funeral is held, um, again a sign that not everybody in Rome had turned against Caesar, that there's still a recognition that he needs to be treated as the elite senator that he was. Um, so Caesar is given a public funeral, and his will is actually read aloud. And Caesar was very savvy about looking after his legacy making sure that he wasn't remembered as a terrible tyrant. What he does in his will is he actually leaves some money, a, a, a donation of 300 sesterces, so a significant amount of money, to each Roman. And he also leaves a, a large tract of land to the Roman people. So it's, it's personal property of his that now becomes the property of the Roman people, and they can get um, income from that property. This immediately turns the tide, and suddenly the people are angry at the assassins. Um, Caesar was very savvy about recognizing that even in death, he needed to assure the support of the people, and he does exactly that. Suddenly, the assassins are seen as enemies of the state rather than as defenders of liberty. So here is a coin that was actually issued um, by, the, by Brutus and Cassius and showing on the left-hand side here um, Lady Liberty, so celebrating the defense of liberty. Um, and one of the ways that the assassins tried to sort of answer back to criticisms by the Senate, by the Roman people, was through the issue, issuance of several different coins that defended their actions, that celebrated liberty um, in particular, but really sort of made it clear that they were fighting on behalf of the Republic and not in their own interests. And here is a, a bust of Mark Antony. He's going to be an important character as we continue our narrative um, over the next several lectures. 
So in the aftermath of Caesar's will being read aloud, the Roman people being given these donations by Caesar, Brutus and Cassius are driven out of Rome. Um, they're still in Italy for a while. Eventually, the Senate will basically arrange for them to leave Italy altogether. They're given um, a governorship outside of Italy, not an important one, um, but it allows them to kind of slink out of town um, with some of their dignity intact, but it also makes it clear that the Senate is, not, is no longer condoning um, their actions. Cleopatra and her son by Caesar return to Egypt. So also getting out of town, this possible heir to the, to, to the throne, as it were. Um, so Cleopatra packs up, leaves town. And in their place, Octavian comes back. Um, Octavian is Caesar's grand nephew. Um, he is more importantly Caesar's adopted heir. So Caesar decides in his will that he's also going to name an heir um, and do this through adoption. And he chooses a family member that is a very young 18-year-old um, that he doesn't know terribly well, but clearly has been impressed by when they fought together at Munda. And so Octavian, who has been off in Illyricum um, on the other side of, of the Adriatic, gets word that Caesar has been assassinated and that he has been named heir in the will and comes back to Rome to stake his claim, um, to play that role as heir. Um, and he brings with him his bosom buddy, loyal sidekick, um, Agrippa. And Agrippa will also play an extremely important role as Octavian makes his way to seizing complete control of Rome. So another good name to keep in mind. Remember, though, at this point in time, Octavian is very young. He's really just a teenager. Um, and he seems to pose no threat. Um, nobody takes him all that seriously, certainly not senators like Cicero, but also not Mark Antony. Um, and initially, Antony really just thinks this is a kid who's come in, and he can be Caesar's heir, but he's not going to rival me for power. But fairly quickly, Octavian is able to turn a lot of supporters of Antony to himself, um, in particular veterans um, that had been loyal to his father. And we'll see sort of over, very quickly, um, over the next year or so after Caesar's assassination, that Octavian is extremely successful in using his father's power, his adopted father Caesar's power, to levy troops, to get, in, to get money, um, and to really stake his own claim as Caesar's descendant to power. And here we have another coin that the assassins, um, Brutus and Cassius, issued, again celebrating the assassination of Caesar. You have the two daggers um, on either side. This is the weapon that was used. And in the middle, what you have is what's called the liberty cap. But this was a cap that slaves wore, um, or freedmen wore, so former slaves that were given this cap when they were freed. And so freedmen would walk around Rome wearing this cap, and it identified them as being ex-slaves who had been given their liberty. Um, and so for the Romans, it was often identified like Lady Liberty with just this, this virtue or, or principle of libertas. So here are some more review questions. I'll let you go over these at your own pace. And when you're done with these, you're done with the lecture.